Ever wondered what is the meaning of life? To reproduce. That's it. Nothing more cosmic and earth-shattering than that. Living organisms exist to reproduce more similar organisms that have the same goal. Nature has built in a sense of adaptability so that species as a whole, rather than the individual, survives to reproduce another round. This adaptability is evolution and works by the integration of genetic information provided by two members of the same species, a male and a female. The male's genetic material for reproductive purposes is packaged in a single-celled tadpole-looking structure called the sperm cell. An adult human male can produce up to half a billion of these things every day. By contrast, the human female's genetic cargo for a reproduction is housed in one egg cell, called the oocyte, and is released for the chance of fertilizing or genetically integrating once a month with a sperm cell. If all the man's genetic info is in the sperm, and all the woman's is in the egg cell, doesn't that mean the fertilized product contains twice the necessary genetic information? A review of mitosis and meiosis is useful here. Detailed discussion will be covered later in this course. In humans, we have 46 chromosomes per cell. A chromosome is a long piece of DNA. Along the length of this DNA are genes. A gene is a coded set of instructions for the assembly of a protein. There can be thousands of genes on each chromosome, or maybe only dozens, because chromosomes come in different sizes. Humans have more than 30,000 genes in their genome, the total genetic complement. Anyway, 46 chromosomes. Since your mom and dad provided equal amounts of genetic information, it turns out that 23 of the 46 chromosomes come from your mom and 23 from dad. Chromosomes are numbered 1 to 22. The 23rd is the sex chromosome. We'll come back to this later. For simplicity, we'll take a look at chromosome number 1. Now, as you can see, there's one from each parent. We refer to this pairing as homologous. They're not identical, but similar. For example, each may contain a gene that codes for eye color. The one from mom codes for brown eyes, but the one from dad codes for blue. These don't look like lengths of DNA, but as a cell needs to divide, the DNA supercoils into what you see here, a chromatid. Brain cells and muscle cells rarely divide, but skin cells and cells that line your digestive tract divide frequently. When the word goes out to divide, the DNA copies itself. Something else we'll talk about later in this course. The DNA supercoils into chromatids and the copies stick together. So here you have a homologous pair, and each one having an identical copy attached to it. After a bit of messing around, the cell divides, and each copy assigns itself its own cell. Notice that each new cell is identical, and that each cell contains the homologous pair. So this is mitosis. When cells divide, the daughter cells are copies of the mother cell. Mitosis occurs, or can potentially occur, to every cell in the body. There's one exception. Mitosis does not occur in the cells that divide to form the sex cells, the sperm and the egg. Cells of the ovary in women and testes in men divide by meiosis. The idea is, by the end of meiosis, the resulting cells have half the DNA of the mother cell. This is so that when the sperm and egg combine during fertilization, the resulting cell will have a full complement of DNA. The meiotically dividing cell looks like a regular cell. And when the word comes to divide, the DNA replicates as before. The homologous pair shown here each have identical copies attached to them. But look what happens here. Instead of the identical pairs splitting, as in meiosis, in meiosis, the homologous pairs separate. Each resulting daughter cell has only one chromosome number one, albeit two identical copies of it, but only one parent's chromosome number one is represented in each cell. The left cell might be the chromosome number one that came from your mom, while the one on the right may be the one that came from your dad. And why have identical copies? That's too much DNA, right? What occurs next is the separation of the identical chromatids in the same manner to how mitosis separated the identical chromatids. And so we have, as a product, four cells. Each cell only has chromosome number one represented by one parent.
Now imagine the four cells are the end products of meiotic events that occurred in the testes of a man and the ovaries of a woman. Any pairing of these cells during fertilization will result in a genetically complete cell. So the testes and the ovaries, the male and female gonads, are the only structures containing cells that divide by meiosis to produce sex cells or gametes. Every other cell in your body divides by mitosis, even cells in the gonads, but the only cells that divide by meiosis are the ones that produce sex cells, and they are only found in the gonads. It's important to distinguish sex cells do not divide at all. The cells that ultimately make the sex cells are the ones that divide by meiosis. Sex cells are the products of meiosis. The gonads also produce sex hormones that control the development of the primary and secondary sex characteristics. Among the meiotically reproducing cells are cells that secrete the sex hormones. The primary sex characteristics are the hardware you're born with, the structures most directly involved in reproduction. Secondary sex characteristics are indirectly related and emerge around puberty. So in males, the production of testosterone during puberty can cause the production of facial hair, body hair, a deeper voice, upper body musculature, sexual desire, and genital enlargement. Whereas in females, again, we can get pubic hair and underarm hair, but we also get breast development, widening of the hips, again sexual desire, and the start of the monthly menstrual cycle.